Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me in the back or not? That's yes. Those of you that are getting your last drinks, we're, this program is going to last about an hour, so the question is how long can you go without another drink, but hopefully long enough to enjoy the program. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Alan Katz, and I want to thank you all for coming tonight. We're actually celebrating the uh, conclusion of two seasons of American Public Square here in Kansas City. And uh, frankly, we could not have done it without the support of many of the people who are here tonight. Uh, and before we, we get going with the program, we have a very short video. For those of you that have not been able to attend all of our meetings and uh, programs, we thought we would try and sort of give you a, just a very brief summary. Now, I know these things never, ever work instantly the way they're supposed to, but Dan Rosenfield, who uh, has put this all together for us, uh, it has assured me this is going to work like clockwork. So that being the case, Dan, you want to give it a start? It's a slow clock. <laughs> okay. So we're going to start in just a second. And, uh, and the other thing, just a couple of notes while Dan's getting that ready. The bar and the food will be open throughout the evening. So uh, you get to help yourself. And after our speaker, we're going to have a game of political trivia. Uh, there are uh, sign-up sheets over there for those of you who would like to play and be on a team. And if you haven't signed up for a team, that there are a team you can sign up. The team can be as large or as small as possible. American Public Square. Non-like-minded people willing to discuss issues in a civil, fact-based manner. It's really time for people who are distressed about the state of politics to push back and to get in the faces of politicians and to say, you know, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take this anymore. So let's, be, let's be clear here. The Americans and uh, Muslims in America have not reached critical mass. There's not an issue with Sharia, Sharia law here. There's not an issue about the issues that are taking place in Europe right now. Their children see grown men You're espousing, espousing oh. hate. Oh, no, no, it's not hate. I'm not a Trump supporter, no. but he didn't say that. I didn't say no, that. No, he did say uh, What did he say? What he said, he said he, he wanted a temporary moratorium on the refugees no, coming said, from Syria. Is anyone here would like And we're also, you know, the only advanced economy in the world that doesn't have guaranteed paid maternity leave. I'm all for American exceptionalism, but this is not exactly where we want to be number one. Then take Jay Johnson's word for it, Secretary of Homeland Security. He went back down to, I believe it was Honduras, it might have been Venezuela, I think it was Honduras, he gave a speech. And in his speech, he said in so many words, he said, parents who are sending your children to the United States, don't do it because they won't qualify for, my, for the amnesty. They had to be here before June 15, 2012. There is no question that for the first time ever in the United States, there is a law that says insurance companies cannot any longer discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions. They can buy insurance coverage, and that has never been part of the law. Dr. Helm, I think the way that you uh, phrased the question originally is very ironic. You said, what can we live with? And the question is not what we can live with. The question is what poor working people can live with. So as a person who was personally affected by hate crime at the Jewish Community Center. I have um, made it a point to try to learn more, but I see both sides, so I wanna ask both, I wanna ask the Muslims a question. American Public Square. Food, facts, conversation, and civility, all in a good night's work. Thank you, Dan. It was a very, very nice job. Uh, look, before we start the program, there are a couple other brief announcements here. First of all, I want to thank some people, which we always have to do because without them, they we wouldn't be here. Uh, Bill and Regina Court, who are the co-chairs of this event, who unfortunately had a schedule conflict, but they still worked very hard, which is one of the reasons that a lot of you are here. Uh, Ward and Donna Katz, uh, who were very instrumental in getting a lot of you here. 
I don't have to say who you are because you know. Uh, Mary Block, our co-chair, along with Peggy Dunn, and Peggy unfortunately has a city commission meeting tonight. But they're the co-chairs of the American Public Square, and they're the people that have uh, uh, guided us to the point that we're at. Uh, also, their sponsors tonight, there are two in particular I want to mention. One is uh, Sue Nerman, and the other is uh, Rob Renier of the Bank of Blue Valley, who uh, were our primary sponsors tonight. We also have uh, Irv Belzer, Tom and Mary Block, Ursula Terrazzi, David Westbrook, the Polzinelli Law Firm, and Mary Beth Blake, and Commerce Bank and Sam Bennett. Thank you all very much for making this possible tonight. Now, if you've been to an American Public Square event before, would you please raise your hand? Okay, well, that's good. That's good. It means we've got a lot of new newbies here tonight. So those of you who've been before, your job is to sign all these people up as members before they leave. Uh, and if you're not a member, by the way, there is on your table a way to become a member. We'd love to have you join. Uh, our favorite roving reporter, Nick Haynes, where are you, Nick? is uh, from KCPT, we'll be taking your questions. On your tables, you see a place where you, where you have forms, fill out the question, hold them up in the air, a volunteer will take them from you, and Nick will help move the questions into the program. Uh, now, it's my pleasure to introduce someone who has uh, been a friend for a while. We met in 2004 at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, she was introduced to me as this conservative columnist that I get to know by a mutual friend. Uh, we since have become very good friends. And uh, while we disagree as much as we agree, we have learned to disagree agreeably. Even though sometimes we agree disagreeably. Uh, in 2010, uh, uh, Kathleen won the Pulitzer Prize for commentary for, quote, her perspective, often witty columns, on an array of political and moral issues, gracefully sharing the experiences and values that lead her to unpredictable conclusions, close quote. Uh, she's a Florida native, uh, where she was a staff writer for the Orlando Sentinel. She joined the Washington Post Writers Group in 2006. She writes a twice weekly column on politics and culture, and her column appears in over 500 newspapers. Locally, it appears in the Kansas City Star. She's also the author, author of Save the Males, Why Men Ma Matter, Why Women Should Care. <laughs> Kathleen, <laughs> Kathleen is married with three sons and divides her time between Camden, South Carolina and Washington, D.C. And what we're going to do tonight is first we're going to hear from Kathleen and then we're going to begin a conversation. So without further ado, it is my great personal pleasure to introduce to you Kathleen Parker. Thank you, Alan. Um, it's true, we did meet in, in Boston those uh, many years ago, and that was, of course, the time when Barack Obama stood up and gave that magnificent speech and talked about how we're not a blue America and a red America, not a black America and a white America. And everyone was kind of swooning with, um, well, first of all, everybody wondered, who is this guy? And I elbowed my friend who was uh, standing next to you, and I said, well, we've just heard the first African American president speak. I had no idea it was going to be four years later. Um, but we were all a little giddy, I think, um, that year. And Alan actually has, has been my, my Democratic source for years and years. And um, yeah, I shouldn't have told that, because I might need you again. Um, and we do agree, I think, actually more than we disagree. And I'm not, um, you know, I, I don't think of myself in terms of labels, but the marketplace needs to label us in some way and my syndicate has to sell me as something. Um, and uh, I remember saying to my, the editorial page editor of the Washington Post, whose name is Fred Hyatt, a couple of years ago, I said, Fred, you know, now that my children are all grown, I think I'd like to go back to being a liberal again. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, what good would you be to me then? <laughs> I know, I don't feel like my thing is on. Well, here. Is, is yours not on, Mr. I've got it on. It's on. Why, you know what? Why don't I just use that? This is what happened to me in Orlando. I did the same thing today in Orlando um, with Bob Woodward. So it's just the same. Is that a lot better? Well, you missed my first story. Darn. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much for um, welcoming me. I, I've never met such friendly people in my life. 
Um, you remind me of my son when he needs money. <clears throat> <laughs> you know, it's like, welcome to Kansas City. Hi, Mom. <laughs> And I also had this great driver who had this like overwhelming civic pride and he talked the entire way from the, the airport to here and he told me all about everyone in this room. So I know all about you, all of you. I know, you're, I know exactly your, uh, your, your stories. So Alan, and um, I, I've really always appreciated what Alan does because even though he is a left-wing uh, commie, he, <laughs> he is, he's always rational and humorous. Um, I know that's contradictory uh, because left-wingers are not rational and humorous, but Alan is the exception, and that's why we've always gotten along. But I, you know, we talk all the time about politics, and, and he had, uh, you know, he's created this new model for solving problems because we all have a great deal more in common than not, and I think very few Americans are really hard left and hard right. I think most of us live in the vast middle. And, um, you know, if I meet uh, any one of you and we sit down and start talking about Donald Trump, I, su I suspect we're going to say pretty much the same thing. Um, but also, he started this in Tallahassee, and I wrote about it years ago, when, and it was called the Village Square, and now, you know, now that he's doing this much grander thing here in Kansas City. So I think it's wonderful, and I think it's great that you all have begun, are participating and helping support this. Uh, maybe if we can do it, I think if we can do things like this on a small scale, then you know, there's, there's hope that we might be able to apply the same principles um, um, on a larger scale. Um, however, having said that, I doubt it. Um, <laughs> I live in Washington, um, and you know, Washington is such a, such a very strange place. Um, it's not, everything is political every minute of every day. So it's awfully, uh, good for people like me who are in the media to come out and, and, and see the rest of the country and spend time with people um, who are not so engaged every single minute. I mean, you know, you, in Washington, your cab drivers are talking to you about politics. You walk out on your front stoop to pick up your newspaper, and the next door neighbor says, oh my gosh, did you see blah? And then, you know, you, it's, it's, well, of course, I live in this crazy world, and I'm, when I get up in the morning, I've got three newspapers, two laptops, a television screen here, and one there, and, and it's overwhelming and, and inundating, and actually, I've, I've pretty much lost my mind, <laughs> especially this particular, um, election season. I've been covering politics since I was a baby in 1980. Um, I started writing a political column. That was when I was in South Carolina at my first newspaper job and we were covering the first Republican convention that was ever held in the state of South Carolina. And I can remember being in the hotel room with Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan and they asked me if, I, if my parents knew that I was there. <coughs> Uh, but I have been around a long time, and I've watched and, and, and studied this process, and I've never experienced anything like what we're, ex we're witnessing now. And I frankly find it quite alarming. For the longest time, we thought, well, this will play out. You know, eventually, um, Donald Trump will get tired of this, he'll get bored, he'll go do something else. But I could never have imagined in a million years that he would become the Republican nominee. Um, nor could I have, I'm sure that Hillary Clinton feels the same way. <laughs> you know, could she have ever imagined, first of all, having to fight Bernie Sanders for the nomination? I mean, you have these two sort of 60s radicals, you know, kind of pounding it out. It's like a little, I don't know, tug of war at the AARP National Convention. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Bernie's, Bernie's pulled Mrs. Clinton far, you know, farther left than I think she probably wanted to go. Uh, well, it'll be interesting to see what happens tomorrow. I think she's going to wrap up that nomination. Pretty certain about that. And then the real uh, horror show begins because I don't have any faith that, that Donald Trump will will change his manners. He said he's not. I mean, he's quite upfront about it. Now I know that this is a conservative state, and I know that probably many of you will be voting for Donald Trump. Um, I will not. I will not. <laughs> I seriously can't. I mean, I feel so strongly about this that, that, that what he represents, and who knows what he represents, because it, you know, it changes minute to minute, or it's blatantly false. Um, I, I was with Bob Woodward earlier this afternoon, and he had a very long interview with, with Donald Trump, and he was trying to pin him down on why he decided, at what point did he have that moment, that, that sort of 
light bulb going off and he decided to run for president. What was it? You know, we all have some moment that makes us decide to do a certain thing that's quite, you know, certainly when, as a life altering as president, you might remember. This transcript went on for pages and pages and pages and he couldn't say. He kept saying, well, you know, I've been a businessman, I've been very successful, I've, been a, I've, been a, I've built a fabulous, uh, yeah, and, and Woodward says, and you made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But when was that moment? What was this moment? And that went on and on and on. I was laughing out loud reading this transcript because there was simply was nothing except this. He was watching Mitt Romney in 2012 and thinking, he, you know, he thinks Mitt Romney was a terrible candidate, true, and that he should have won, true. And he looked at that and he thought, I can win. So he is essentially saying that he decided to run for president because he, he could win. It's always about winning. You know, don't you remember? We're all going to be so tired of winning. We're going to get bored. I can't wait. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of what that sort of, you know, wraps up his, his, uh, the, his entire motivation. And uh, otherwise, you know, I, I wanted, I'll just use Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, as, as, as an example of how I feel because Paul Ryan did not do what I had hoped he would. I very much wanted him to come to the lectern and say, you know, I have thought long and hard about this. I've prayed, I've spoken to my family and my close friends, and I'm here today to tell you that I cannot support Donald Trump. And the reason I can't is because it would betray everything I believe. It would betray my children and everything I have taught them. It would betray my faith which calls for compassion and empathy and understanding. And today I'm going to surrender my position as the Speaker of the House and I'd like to continue to serve in the House. And I would have, think about that. You know, everybody says, oh no, he had to fall in line, he had to fall in line because, because what? Because you've got to protect these, you know, these lower ballot people in the Senate and the House who are, who are, who are vulnerable. And I, I understand that. He had to fall in line because he's got things he wants to accomplish in the House of Representatives. He's got a plan and he wants to, he's talked to Donald Trump and he thinks Donald Trump is going to help him do what he wants to do. But the, the, the real situation, I don't want to talk about Trump all night, but I, I do feel very strongly about this and I don't want to insult people who like him or Republicans who feel that anybody but Hillary is better or who are so concerned about the Supreme Court that that's the most compelling reason to vote for him. I understand all of that. But I do think that you don't really have any basis for believing that Donald Trump is going to do one thing or another. Because he's, all we know, all we can rely on are his own words. And his own words have told us nothing. He doesn't understand policy. And he'll say something outrageous, say, well, you know, that was just a suggestion. Or, um, you know, and he's insulted nearly everyone. He finally, he goes out to New Mexico and insults Susana Martinez, the governor, who is our rising star, our, our, fee, our woman uh, Hispanic person. What is he thinking? He has this really self-destructive uh, quality about him, I think. Anyway, so Paul Ryan did not do that, and uh, nor did anyone else. But I would just for once, just, want, just for once have someone stand up with great courage and at great cost to, to him or herself and just say, this is what I think is the right thing to do. Imagine that. So, um, and I think other people would have fallen in line with him. I, my next door neighbor, I live, my closest friends in Washington are my next door neighbors. They're um, a gay married couple. They've been together 30 years. And they, uh, my, uh, Craig, one of them said, you know, um, I would have followed um, that man if he had said something like that. Anyway, moving on. That's, I, I, I've written a lot about Donald Trump and I, and I do it because I think it's my duty. I've heard from editors who say, could you just stop doing that? Could you write about something else? I said, well, you know, what is more important than this? <laughs> and I, you know, I know that Hillary Clinton is, is, is to many people also undesirable, including many Democrats. I mean, who wants to relive that whole drama? <clears throat> and she has a problem with honesty. She has unfavorability ratings as high as Donald Trump's. I mean, here we have the two nominees who are the least, well, the least liked candidates ever in the history of presidential elections. And these are our choices. So we're, about, we're down to kind of, okay, who, is, who makes us feel the least sick to our stomach? <laughs> um, so here, here's how I view it. Um, <clears throat> I know that Hillary Clinton has a lot of baggage and she has some problems with honesty. She doesn't like, she's 
the most opaque person we know. Um, she doesn't tell the truth. She has, um, and even if she doesn't need to tell a lie, which I don't like to use that word, the softly strong, but even if she is in a pretty clear position, she'll still appear as though she's hiding something. So her default position, probably from years of covering for her husband, is to, um, is to at least act like there's something that you want to find out. I've met her in person. She's delightful. She's warm. She's friendly. She does lie. And here's how I know. I ran into her at a dinner, a big dinner in Washington, and I was seated as close to her. She was at the next table. You're looking very serious. Are you mad at me? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Is anybody else mad at me? I see a few people are mad at you. You mad at me? Oh, come on. I, told Kansas, I heard, was told by my driver that Kansas City people don't hold grudges against people for political positions. Now, I'm an equal opportunity offender, so I will probably offend everyone before it's over. Um, so anyway, I meet her at this dinner, and I, I stood up because I had not met her when she was in uh, First Lady. I was, you know, I was back in South Carolina raising three ungrateful children. <laughs> so I said, I stood up and I said, Secretary Clinton, I finally, we finally get to meet. I'm Kathleen Parker. And she goes, oh, I love your column. I really do. And I said, oh my gosh, she lies. <laughs> <laughs> She probably does, because I do, I, huh? She is a good politician. I feel so sorry for that woman. I mean, sitting in that dinner that night was actually Emily's List gala. And I was there with my gay couple neighbors and a lesbian couple from San Francisco. See how conservative I am? Uh -huh. Anyway, they give a lot of money to, the, to Emily, so I got this fancy table. And um, so I watched Mrs. Clinton or I don't know, what are we supposed to call her? Secretary Clinton, soon President Clinton. Um, yeah, no, I, she's, she is gonna be our next president. You do know that. No, I'm sorry. I am not the, the kind of person who wants to vote for somebody because I wanna see the first woman president. I don't care. I want to, I want to vote for the most qualified person. Um, I mean, I don't, it's not that I don't care, it's just that that's not, top of the list. All other things being equal, yes, I would vote for her as the, for, as the woman, but I'm, you know, I'm not, not mad at men. I wrote a book saying how much I love them. So, um, so I think Hillary, uh, so I watched her and the woman is watched, I wasn't the only one watching, you know, there are about 4,000 other people watching her. Every minute the woman can't take a breath and so she has to sit there with a the smile plastered on her face then, she said, then people say, oh, she just looks so fake, or she looks inauthentic. And she tries to take a sip of, uh, of tea or wine, and suddenly everybody, every camera in the room is flashing. And during the course, you know, the breaks between the various courses, she was just mug, mobbed by people who wanted to have their selfie taken. I did too, by the way. Um, <clears throat> I'm also an equal opportunity nice person. So I don't, uh, I don't treat people like they're um, political enemies just because they might be on the other side of where my more core beliefs. But my, you know, my, my beliefs, as I said, they're, they're, not, they're not hard in, you know, they're not in cement. I'm not an ideologue, in other words. Um, I like to think things through. I like to hear both sides of a story. And I will always talk to, I mean, most of my friends, I have my friends of all sorts. And, um, and I, you know, everybody, in, in, you know, and there's no one in Washington who won't talk to me because they think I'm not gonna be fair. They, I think they do think that I'll treat them fairly. Then there are those times. I don't think um, Trump thinks I've treated him fairly, but he doesn't like anybody in the media. He did write me a letter, however. He did. He, he scribbled a little note on one of my columns and had it sent to me, and it says, Dear Kathleen, I'm gonna be great for everyone. You're going to be so proud of your country. <laughs> Donald. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I just went on a little rant there. Well, Is that what I'm supposed to do? What's that? No, no. That's, I was going to ask you a question. Oh, okay. Can you hear me back there or not? Yeah. No? Yeah. Sort of. Do that. Okay. I wanted to ask you a question, and that is, is that, okay, you, we're talking about people in Washington. You write columns that, in, that, that about these people on a fairly regular basis, sometimes nice, sometimes not so nice. So tell us what happens when somebody who really doesn't like what you wrote calls you? They don't. <laughs> Gosh. No, I get mail, you know, and I keep it all in a, I have like a warehouse full of trunks of 
mail, and I'm going to read them out loud at, in the home when we have share time. <laughs> Um, I get uh, less email than I used to because now everybody goes on to the, f the forums and just says what they want to say. Um, I don't think anyone, first of all, I don't think anyone knows my phone number. But, um, I, you know, I, I work independently, even though I'm uh, um, syndicated by the Post. I don't have a place at the Post. Um, and I don't know that I have a telephone. But, I, but what's awkward is when you walk into uh, the green room. Like if you're going to do a television show on Sundays, I often do meet the press. And you go into makeup. It's very fancy. Uh, it's like being in the brewery, but there are people putting makeup on you. So, <laughs> so strange. And so here's what happened. I had written a column about the North Carolina governor and this law that they pushed through very quickly, um, you know, ostensibly to keep men from going into the little girl's bathroom. But it, had, it did a lot of other things. It, it meant that people could deny service to gays. You could say, no, I'm sorry, you can't stay in our hotel. We don't let people like you stay here. So I, I was highly critical of that. Um, and lo and behold, I'm asked to be on uh, Meet the Press that weekend, and, and I'm told as I walk in the door that we're going to have a remote interview with the, with the governor, that he's going to be part of the show. And I said, great. I walk into makeup, and he's sitting in makeup in the chair next to me. <laughs> and I said, governor, I think we probably ought to chat. I just <laughs> decided just to go head first. And you know, we're both Carolinians, so we're polite. and and friendly, and, and he just, he, boy, he was, I think I described him in the next column as having reptile eyes and, and something smiles, I can't remember, but it was pretty good. And, uh, you know, Southerners can just, you know, they'll just stick that knife right between your ribs and just say, darling, you are so cute. <laughs> so that's how, it was a little awkward, but we just talked it out, and then he did sit down at the table with us, and, and um, you know, it was fine. We disagree. Um, and then, you know, but my column wasn't only just about, it wasn't just to say that he was wrong, I was simply pointing out that he was, he did this the week before the high point market, you know, it's like 5,000, 10,000 gay people come and buy furniture and com contribute about six billion dollars to the state. So I thought that was sort of a poor timing in economic sense, but anyway, okay. that happens. Somebody once said, I, I can't remember who it was, um, that you should never write anything that you would feel uncomfortable um, seeing that person. And I, don't, I try not to be mean-spirited. I do try to be entertaining and in interesting. Um, and then there's some people that I just figure, I don't care about that bridge, you know? I'm obviously not planning to go to the Trump White House. <laughs> okay. So I think that, if, if memory serves me correctly, you were one of the first columnists uh, to who, who is not identified as a liberal, to point out that Sarah Palin may not be the most qualified person to be president of the United States. And as I recall, you were kind enough to share with me some of the fan mail that you received after that. Why don't you share a little of that experience without some of the explicit fan mail? Okay. No, I couldn't say any of those things publicly. But, you know, it was the f strangest thing, because I always have, for years, I've been writing a column for 30 years. I've always been pretty blunt and direct and and straightforward and fearless, I would say. Um, but I was also writing from a bunker in a remote location in South Carolina for most of those years. So anyway, I'm watching. I was very excited about Sarah Palin at first. I thought, this is great, you know, because we don't have to all be the same, we women. There are, we come in lots of varieties, and all I knew about her was that she was a governor of a state. And I thought, well, great. So anyway, I watched those first three interviews, and the, the Katie Couric interview was, was the, the breaking point. <laughs> and I wrote the column. And I just said, you know, it's, she's got this going for her. She's got this lovely, 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 cute as a button, cute as a button. But she is an idiot. No. <laughs> I didn't really use that word, because I, I try to avoid the ad hominem. There are more clever ways to say what I, what I just said. Anyway, I was flooded with hate mail, and this is when I learned that conservatives aren't really all that nice. I kind of knew that, because I grew up in the South. But I got 20,000 emails within the first couple of days after that. I had speeches canceled. I had friends turn on me. I mean, turn on me. Republicans were furious. And, I mean, talking about the Republican establishment in Washington, they were furious because they felt that I had actually, I had betrayed them. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm a journalist. 
I told, I'm not a team player. I'm not on the team, you know? I'm gonna write what I think is true and I'm not gonna stop. And this is what I thought. And here's the thing, the reason I wrote the column is because everybody was talking about it. It's just that no one was saying it. It was actually my son, who is now 30 years, 31 years old, gosh, he's getting old, um, who said, Mom, you gotta do it. You gotta do it. And the way I ended it was she should step down from the ticket, which is terrible advice. No one ever uh, benefits from that. But I just thought, again, it's a principle thing. You know, it's not good for the country. It's bringing down the party. It's bringing down the ticket. It's embarrassing us. You know, I think the reason women were so upset is because if you are going to be the first woman anything, you owe it to other women to be good or great because we always have higher standards. So when Shannon Faulkner wanted to be the first woman cadet at the Citadel, Dad Gummit, get in shape, girl. She showed up and couldn't do a push-up, and she gained a bunch of weight. And I thought, you know, come on, you can't do that. You can't, you can't do that. You've got to be qualified for the job you're applying for. And, and Sarah Palin wasn't, and she, I think she just really embarrassed us. And, you know, I've rested my case a thousand times, and everyone is now speaking to me again. But um, that was a very eye-opening experience. It was, it was pretty painful, to tell you the truth, but it was also liberating. You know, we tend, even though we, we want to be independent and, and um, neutral as we pursue a topic, we might, I'm going to end up on, a, on, the, on an opinion because that is what I'm supposed to do. I get paid for opinion, so I try to reach a conclusion. So, um, but, you know, I haven't gotten one single uh, note saying, you know what, You're, you were right and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That just hadn't happened. Okay. So, so let, let, let's, let's talk about that. I think what's happened with the media in some ways, at least the perception for a lot of us, is it's sort of fallen into slots. There's the liberal media and there's the conservative media. And therefore, when someone goes, you know, if you're looking, watching Fox News, you're getting what you expect. If you're watching MSNBC, you're getting what you expect. And in between, you're getting a lot of entertainment. Uh, I th the, 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 how hard is it as a, as a columnist and a journalist living in a town like Washington where you encounter these people all the time and they have some impact on your access to other people. How hard is it to sort of just push that aside and sort of come straight at it in a way that uh, you're willing to deal with those consequences? Well, it is hard and I, and I, don't, um, I don't feel like I have a lot of fellow toilers in that field. I really do think I do that <clears throat> and I get praise from people who understand that I'm doing that, but I don't have uh, much of a support system. You know, and a lot of these writers in town are not really journalists, I mean, you know, columnists and the people you see on television. Um, they sort of just play one on television and it's annoying. So I came up through the newsroom and I mean, I was a, you know, a reporter on the street in 1977. I wrote three stories before noon. I've covered everything, cops, county council, city council, courts, all that. So I have a, a real uh, solid base of what journalism is and what it's supposed to do. And I also learned a lot from covering you know, regular people in out of the way places. Uh, there's not a young journalism graduate today that would do what I have done and in, the, in paying my dues. They want to come out and they want my job right away. So there's not a lot of support for you if you go out on a limb. You're kind of out there by yourself. Um, and the access question, I think, is critical. If you write something about Donald Trump, for example, or Hillary, or, you know, or John Boehner, whoever, and they don't like it, then they can just shut you out. You don't have access to that person anymore. And you can't really afford, it, when you're covering things at this level, you can't really afford to alienate everyone. Um, and so I try very hard not to be, I, tr I really do try to be, make rational arguments and be sensible and be, and be fair. I don't know if I succeed every time, but that's sort of what I'm trying to do. But a lot of these, uh, and, and you know, access is everything in Washington. But a lot of the politicians now can, can go around the media. They don't need us anymore because they can go, they can tweet you know, um, Trump tweets, I don't know how many t tweets a day. He was sitting with a friend of mine, Robert Draper, who write, wrote a profile about Trump just recently for the New York Times. They were seated at a table in Mar-a-Lago because Draper gets really into the personality and spends time, a lot of time with the people he's writing about. And 
Donald Trump got up from the table. It was during that dinner. He got up from the table and disappeared for about 10 minutes. He went, that's when he went and tweeted about his wife being better looking than Ted Cruz's wife. <laughs> right there during dinner, he could not control himself. That was so compelling, he had to go do it right then. Isn't that crazy? Uh, so I guess I don't. Um, I, there's no one I feel like I can't pick up the phone and call on the Hill. Um, I've, I've definitely developed a good relationship with Valerie Jarrett. In fact, she's a friend. I like her very much. We, we bonded over the fact that we have children the same age and we're women and, you know, we have... I belong to a group of women in the media that we... We're not an official club of any sort, but we get together periodically to celebrate us. You know, basically, if somebody gets a new job, whether it's in the White House or on the Hill or uh, editor of a new department, whatever it is, we get together and it's bipartisan. You're going to love this. It's bipartisan. Republicans and Democrats, we are there to, you know, to, to drop all, it's, there's no agenda, it's all off the record. We invite, you know, when Loretta Lynch became the Attorney General, we had a get together for her. And we all take turns um, giving these, having these events at different houses, um, mostly the ones who have the bigger houses, because, you know, we, and now it's become this big deal where everybody wants to be invited. Um, but as, as the organizer puts it, we don't, you don't get to come to the party to become well relevant. You're at the party because you are relevant. I love that. <laughs> so, but, you know, I've gotten to know people that I would never have gotten to know. I know all the, you know, the communications people in the White House. And, and I feel like I can call any of those people because we understand that we're not enemies. And we're there to do our respective jobs, obviously. And maybe they don't always like what I write. But, you know, I'll, I'll call Valerie and I'll say, hey, you know, I didn't realize that was your idea to put the president between two ferns. <laughs> and sorry about that. And she said, don't worry about it. I got pretty tough skin. But, you know, then the other day when they had a shooting at the White House, I called her and I said, I just want you to know I'm thinking about you. And she said, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, so anyway, there, there are bipartisan moments in Washington, but it takes place mostly among women. And I think maybe um, women will ultimately save the day. I don't say that with any... Um, animus toward men, uh, I just think that women do have a, a knack for sitting down and talking honestly and not getting so freaked out about it, you know? And the men, I guess they go play golf together. I don't know what you people do. But <laughs> it's a weird little, little society over there on Capitol Hill, especially in the Republican Party. I, I, you know, it's just, when it started with the Tea Party and and then, and, and then came the Freedom Forum people, and they are just, um, they're not team players, and Paul Ryan's supposed to change that so that, you know, and they've all had a little hobnob, and I think they're gonna start um, maybe talking to each other more often, and he's trying to let all the members have more input into what takes place. John Boehner ruled kind of with a, you know, a magic wand. He would let you know what, what everybody was gonna do. Um, but Paul is supposed to do something a little different. But I will tell you, that is a, men's, a man's world. That House of Representatives is a man's world. I don't care how many women you have in there. They're not uh, listening to the women, and the men run the show. Kathy McMorris Rogers is the highest ranking female Republican in the, in the government, in, in the government period. And, um, you know, I've, I've had many heart to heart talks with her about, you know, how she can be heard and how she can be part of the conversation at a different level. But, you know, what the problem is that women just communicate differently. Uh, she doesn't have, I don't know, she can't just strut into the gym and say, you know, hey guy, you know, this is what I want to do. They're actually kind of edging her out because she's a very sweet person, very mild-mannered, and um, it's, just, it's just a fact. It's just a fact. I don't think there's a war on women on the Republican side, but it, I wouldn't say it's, um, you know, I don't think they're sitting down having beers together, but the women are. All the women senators get together regularly and talk once a month and have a, just a little powwow. So I don't. I think maybe part of the part of the solution to our partisan uh, division is to get more women elected to office. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let, 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 uh, and I love men. Yeah. Let, let, let me. Can you all hear me now? Uh, let me just sort of say this. First of all, if you would like to ask a question, you have sheets of paper. Write them down. Hold them up. And Nick Hain is going to pick them up from you, and, and we're going to and we're going to get them asked. Let me ask Kathleen one uh, while this is going on. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna turn my mic up. Can you hear me now in the back or not? Yeah, I see some heads nodding. Yes. I don't know okay. what happened to mine. Uh, 
Okay, here. Oh. That's a little too much. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Okay. No, no, no. Okay, okay. We need something between what you just did and. <laughs> it. Are we? Uh, is that better now in the back? You hear me? Okay. Uh, Kathleen, I want to ask you this question. What we do can in America? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me talking now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay so in American Public Square. Yeah. We have this idea of people who don't agree with each other uh, being able to sort of have a, a fact-based civil conversation, and. The underlying premise, and I'm curious whether you think this premise makes sense, is that the, the real problem is people with whom we disagree, we have a tendency to ascribe the worst motives to them for why we disagree with them. For example, if you were for privatizing Social Security, Democrats looked at it and said, you hate poor people, you hate right. old people, that's why you're going to do it. You're trying to give more money to Wall Street. Okay. Right. Or if you disagree with Obamacare, you, you're a racist. I mean, it's just it, ridiculous. Right. And, and, yeah, or the fact is, is that if you basically support Obamacare, it's because you like to give welfare out to everyone. You're you want to destroy our health care system. So the, it seems to me that uh, we really need, that, that, that the real issue is, is almost getting people to give others the benefit of the doubt. Not that they agree with them, but that the basis of their conclusion is not venal. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. And so what I've realized, uh, you know, people think that everybody in Washington is, are, you know, scoundrels and ne'er-do-wells, but the truth is everybody in Washington is serious, hardworking, and um, really wants to make the world a better place. It's true. You know, they're, and they're good people. All those representatives are good people. Um, I, there's no one evil in there, you know, but I just, I just no think one? it's, well. I, I can think of one or two, but never know. Okay, well, I won't, <laughs> I'm not going to say names, but uh, uh, I Nick, think it's going to work better for me to hold this like this. Right. Nick, you have a question for Absolutely. Me. Remember, the magic of Kathleen Parker is not available in the shops. Uh, she's available at the Washington Post and in your Kansas City Star every week. We're like Radio Shack. Uh, if you've got questions, we've got answers. <laughs> Elena <laughs> has a question for us. Would you mind standing? Kathleen, thanks for being here. My question is this. I feel very strongly that the media is actually the organization that spurred on Donald Trump's campaign. And so my question to you is, do you and your journalist colleagues talk about what you could do to maybe better manage campaigns? Well, thank you for asking that question. Um, so first of all, I heard you say the media organization. Okay, the, the media are not a monolithic group. Okay, so I work for a, a, a newspaper that has a long tradition of solid, serious journalism. We have standards, we have ethics policies, we have enforceable rules, and we dig deep. Um, I'm a columnist, I'm in a, lot, a very different kind of role, but, the, but reporting is taken very seriously, and we have fine, fine people doing this, this necessary work. Cable television is different from network television. Um, and then you have all these alternative media outlets and you have social media. So it's very hard to control how people conduct themselves. So I agree with you totally that the media allowed this, uh, they, they advanced his career in, in, in ways that they all, I'm sure, deeply regret. So, I mean, you know, the, the tele I think television bears more responsibility simply because the, the visual medium is just stronger and people pay more attention to it. And uh, so Donald Trump is primarily a marketing genius. He understands very well how you get the media's attention. So he would, you know, in the very beginning, he would come up with these just ridiculous statements, you know, so the Mexicans were this and the Muslims are this. And now he's talking about this judge who can't, who can't rule on his uh, university, Trump University case because he was born in Indiana of Mexican descent and he's proud of his heritage? Are you kidding me? What is he talking about? This is insanity. But every time he said something crazy, he could know that he would have 48 hours of complete coverage. And he bragged that he didn't have to buy ads. Well, of course he didn't have to because te television was doing it all for him. So I think that's uh, a problem, but I don't think it's ever going to be solved because ratings, ratings, ratings. Um, you know, if, if he says something, if Donald Trump showed up on someone's show, their ratings spiked. 
and, the, and television as a business model is not going to stop the person coming in the door who's going to make money for them. And Donald Trump was a money maker. I remember when the debates were going on and, and you know, people were worried that Donald Trump was going to drop out before they had their turn, whatever, whether it was CNN or NBC or whatever. So it, it's a big, big problem. And I would love to, um, you know, I think Huffington Post at some point decided they were not going to cover him anymore. But honestly, when this person is the front runner in the Republican primary, how do you not cover him? I think you could say we're going to cover him when he says something substantive that has merit and that deserves to be dealt with. But what, what has happened, this all has evolved just a bit, so maybe there's hope, which is the fact that if you really look into Donald Trump's business deals, you look into, you know, there are lots and lots of lawsuits, there are lots of um, bad business deals, a lot of dubious uh, connections. He will, he will take care of his own um, uh, problems. I mean, he will. He is his own problem if we only cover it. You know, we just have to dig deep and do the real reporting rather than going, "Oh my gosh, isn't this just crazy?" You know, that's the easy fun thing. But it's no longer funny anymore. And so I think. We can't all sit down at a big table and make a decision. You know, the good newspapers will say, okay, we'll, we won't cover him anymore, but then National Enquirer does, and, or then Drudge does. Nobody was gonna write about Monica Lewinsky back in the day because they didn't have enough information. They were still researching, investigating, at the journalists were. Uh, but then it, you know, then it hits Drudge, and Drudge then drags us all down to the tabloid level, and it's very hard to, frankly, stay in the business if you're the only uh, news organ that's not reporting what people are interested in. And people's tastes are not really all that high-minded for the most part. And Alan, if Kathleen only had a few more seconds, she would have said public television was part of the solution. But Pat is here with a question. It is. Pat, <laughs> your question. If you were Hillary Clinton, who would you pick as your vice president? You know, I think I would probably... I would like to see her pick Corey, Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey. He is amazing. I went. I heard him speak. He was her. He was her warm-up speech in Florence, South Carolina, at the African American church. And honey, let me tell you, that boy is. He has spent some time in church. He knows what he's doing. And he was just dynamic and just told these great stories. And he just really understands how to connect. But she's already got the African American vote. I'm not sure New Jersey is a key point, pivotal state for her. Um, so I'm thinking uh, this is in Castro, which Castro, the I take, you, guy. take your pick. Either one would be great, but um, you know, they're, they're very, uh, well, no, I'm, I'm talking about the HUD person. I can't remember which one he is. Is he I Julio I, or? I, 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 I forget too. You know who I'm they're, talking they're about. See, they're identical twins. But so I'm kind of thinking campaign. it might be one of those two people. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Sue Ellen Freed has a question. Sue Ellen? Oh my gosh, will you do my voicemail thing? Absolutely. <laughs> Kathleen Parker is not here, but I know she wants to talk to you. <laughs> Do you think that if Scalia were still alive and on the Supreme Court, that people like Paul Ryan and Bob Dole and many others would not support publicly Donald Trump? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure I get it. I mean, I think the reason that people who we think should be saying the same thing you're saying yeah. um, are more concerned about having a Supreme Court appointee. Well, okay, so I do see that point. And yes, that's, that's an excellent point. Sorry I didn't get it sooner. Um, I do think it would take a lot of pressure off. Um, but I don't know that it would have changed the dynamic of the primary race. In other words, people would still have nominated Donald Trump. It didn't have anything to do. Um, but they might be able to more easily say, I'm not going to support him because the Supreme Court would not be at stake. That, you know, it's an interesting point. Kathleen, we have a question from Bill. Kathleen, you wrote a column recently uh, in which you described a Memorial Day parade in, uh, in Maryland, I believe. It was a lovely piece. And what I'm, it, it, it tried to show what the real America is about. My question is, what wouldn't Trump or Clinton get about that? What, do you think? what wouldn't they get about? Uh, so I wrote this column about I was um, 
in Oxford, Maryland, where I spend a lot of time. I try to get out there on weekends just to get out of the crazy city. And it's just a little town of 500 people. It's a little fish, fishing village, and a lot of people sail around there. But it's on the, you know, it's on the eastern shore of Maryland, um, around the Chesapeake Bay area. So um, I just wandered down to the to the town park, and they were having a s sweet little Memorial Day ceremony, and the local veterans all had, had come, and um, you know, we just had a little a little ceremony. The minister of the, the Episcopal Church, the, the Episcopal priest, like is, you know, sort of. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's getting a little bit difficult. Uh, you know, he had a service, and we uh, we all bowed our heads, and we had the color guard, and the veterans saluted. And it was just a very touching, sweet moment, and I was overwhelmed by sadness because I thought, this is who we really are, you know? This is who we really are, this country. And yet I feel like it's coming unraveled. I don't feel that when I'm in Kansas City. I don't feel like that when I'm in Oxford, Maryland. When I'm in any place in America outside of the what we call the Acela Corridor, which is where we zip up and down the eastern seaboard between Washington, Philadelphia, and New York, um, you know, everybody's got their briefcases and their business cards, and that's life on the, among those people. And everything is, it's not touching ground, you know? So I feel, you know, I just, I don't know exactly, um, I can't remember what, you know, I never can remember what I say in columns. I, I just don't. People say, oh, I love that column you wrote. They can't remember either, but they expect me to, and I can't. <laughs> so um, what they wouldn't get, I think, <clears throat> I think they'd probably get it. I think they'd both kind of get it. You know, Hillary Clinton wasn't always a Washington a person, and she wasn't always uh, in government. She was once a, a little Goldwater girl and grew up in the Midwest herself in Methodist church. And so I think she would feel at home, probably more so than she does in her usual locales, because these people are not interested in fancy, you know? <laughs> they don't care if you're a celebrity, Ben Stein wanders around there a little bit. Um, and then Trump, I don't think Trump, he would, he would know how to, how to schmooze everybody, but I don't know that there's anything real in his heart. I really don't, because I do believe he is um, a classic, um, are there any psychiatrists in here? I don't want to overstep. I do think he's a complete narcissist, and you know, we throw that word around a lot, but I think he truly is pathologically, clinically a narcissist. So I don't know, you never know with a narcissist whether there's anything genuine. They know very well what you want. They're very good at reading what you want to hear from them, and they deliver it. Um, but it doesn't mean anything. Now you could say that's true of all politicians, by degrees, but it's, it's, it's not really, is it? I mean, everybody, all politicians want to please their audience, of course, but, yeah. You need a mic. You deal with all this stuff all the time. So my question really is this. So we have in this country, uh, and I don't think, unfortunately, it's just on the Excel corridor, but I think throughout the country, we have this partisan divide. Now, we've always had a partisan divide of sorts, but it just seems to be so much sharper and so much more, you're either with, the, too, many, too much is a zero-sum game. Yeah. There was a time when people on the fringes could be marginalized, but now they have the megaphone. Yeah. What can we do? Gosh, that, that's a big question. I think you're, what you're doing is, is part of what we need to do. Um, one of the things that Newt Gingrich instituted when he was Speaker of the House was he told everybody to go home on weekends. And instead of staying in town and getting together for dinners and um, you know having relationships in the community, you know Washington is a community. It's uh, there are certain parts that I mean there's it's a factory town of course, and a lot of people disappear at the end of the workday and spend hours in traffic and go back to Virginia or Maryland. But sticking around for the weekend is how relationships develop between people like Ted Kennedy and and um, uh, you know some of the older great stars that we remember from earlier days in Washington. Um, and I think that was a big mistake, a huge, huge mistake. Um, I think cable television contributed greatly to our partisanship by, you know, p pitting people against each other. You're, you're supposed to always disagree. I briefly, I, I did a little TV show um, out of New York with Elliot Spitzer, and I, 
I can't tell you how evil he is. <laughs> That's another bridge I don't care about. Um, I know you know how bad he is. But anyway, you know, I said to them, it was not the show I signed up for. And they fired the, the president of CNN two weeks before we launched the show. And so whatever I was hired to do was never going to happen. Um, I was just there to sanitize Elliot so that he could then have, you know, become master of the universe. But he has, a, he has a killer instinct, and he has to destroy anyone in his path, and that's just the way it is. But I remember I kept saying, they said, well, you've got to argue with him. And I said, well, you know, first of all, that's not my temperament. That's not what I signed up to do. Um, my editor, my, I had a personal uh, producer who sort of kept me off of the ledge. Um, and he said, you know, Kathleen, they wanted Ann Coulter, and they got E.B. White, and they hated you for it. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the whole, you know, you got to have tension, you got to have tension. And I, I thought, if I ever write a memoir about that horrible experience, I'll call it good TV. Because good TV means you have to be a certain kind of personality. It doesn't mean you have to be smart, necessarily. In fact, I think if you're a little bit dumb, it's helpful. Because you can't think. You're not supposed to think. You're just supposed to react, react, react. And they don't even care. I said, you know, if, we were, if, kill, if ripping the heads off chickens would get our ratings up, we would be ripping the heads off chickens. It didn't matter. So I would have all these smart people come on. And I would say, you know, I have a one-on-one -on -one interview that we tape, and I'd say, and it never ran. I said, why didn't you run that interview with so-and-so? And they said, well, it just wasn't good TV. <laughs> you know, just wasn't good TV. So basically, no Republican was good TV. And, uh, and they didn't want to come on anyway, because they didn't want to be, you know, prosecuted by Elliot Spitzer. And then when they would let me speak to them directly, he'd pitch a little fit. So um, it's very hard when you have all these forces throughout our, our media that require the, 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 the oppositional tension. But yeah. I think women can solve this problem. Did I say that already? Absolutely. <laughs> Kathleen, we have a question for you at the back of the room. David with a question. David? Kathleen, thank you very much. And in the, in the interest of full disclosure, I must tell you that I am blind, so that if you were Donald Trump, I would tell you, please don't wink at me. <laughs> <laughs> now, the question I have, Andrew Sullivan, one of your conservative columnist colleagues, recently wrote an articulate column in the New York Magazine in which he talked about the possibilities of populism expressed by Trump that can lead to tyranny. And he referred to the book, not well written, but well articulated, It Can't Happen Here. Can it happen here? Is Donald Trump a threat to well, the republic? Well, I think he is, and I've, I've written that. Um, I had a good friend who called me up one morning. She said, "You know, I pity you because you don't, you can't, you can't ignore the decline, the the uh, decline of Western civilization, <laughs> <laughs> the ruin." Uh, here's the thing. Again, we don't know what Donald Trump will do as president. We've each year, each term, we've we've expanded executive powers more and more, <clears throat> and you know, even President Bush did it. President Obama has done it. Um, and I think, you know, even though Trump has railed against the executive expansions of executive powers, you know, he will certainly be busy with that himself, I feel sure. But when you have um, a personality that, as he does, that, in, that actually inflames people, purposely in, enrages them, he said in this interview with, my, with Bob Woodward, I bring rage out in people. He knows it, and he does it purposely. And then, once he's got them all worked up, he says, just punch him in the nose for me, or, you know, he doesn't discourage violence, he encourages it. He may not say it in so many words, but he creates the environment for that. So what happens when you have this volatile situation? What happens in Cleveland when these various groups come together and to protest and things get out of hand? So he's created an environment where things getting out of hand are now becoming routine. What happens then? The National Guard comes in. Maybe somebody gets hurt. Maybe somebody gets shot. Then what happens? So basically, what I'm suggesting is that you create an environment where you need greater state control over the people you've decided to riot. And I don't know where that leads. We do have other branches of government um, who are supposed to rein that sort of thing in. Um, but, you know, I don't, in any case, I, you know, I've, I'll just, yeah, I've written about it a good bit because um, 
quite frankly, a lot of my Jewish friends called me and said, you know, you've just got to write about it. You've got to say it. You've got to put it. I think it was you. <laughs> I forgot. Oh, my gosh. Well, he was one of them, okay? Not my only Jewish friend, though. I'm, oh, a lot of my friends are Jewish. <laughs> yeah. We have time one more question. Yep. Steve Good. is going to move us into the other side of the political divide. Steve, would you stand up for us? Thank you very much. Your question? Thank you, Catherine, for joining us tonight. I just wondered your thoughts on how do we go about keeping the young people who have been engaged in uh, the, the process um, when Hillary becomes the nominee of the Democratic Party? I just saw in The Guardian that she'd gotten enough votes and delegates in order to since the nomination. So. I think it's important that we keep the millenniums uh, engaged in the process and your thoughts on that. Well, you know, first of all, I think all these young people who've supported Bernie Sanders, <clears throat> you know, don't want to support Hillary Clinton. And, and so your question is, you know, legitimate. Um, <clears throat> well, I think one way is you have to give them a reason to be involved. Um, and I don't mean just electing, you know, the guy that reminds you of your favorite professor or, you know, the guy that can play saxophone or, you know, make a basket across the court, but somebody who says, who explains the ways that he is going to, or she is going to uh, get you a job. You know, so many of these young people have moved back home. And I've got a son who's 31. He's a lawyer. <clears throat> he works for the Humane Society and lives in Washington. And you know, it took him a year to get a job right out of law school, and it's taken him, and he's not making enough money. I mean, nobody is making enough money um, anywhere. So even people who have jo good jobs are not, they're not as, un as well employed as they should be. So I think we have to come find, um, you know, we have to make them believe that there's a way to turn this thing around and that there's a way for them to, to make a difference, but also to move out of their parents' house, you know? I, Oh my gosh, you know, my husband lives in South Carolina, my son and I both live in Washington, and Woody's always looking for ways that I can save money. And he said, don't you think you and John could just live together? And I said, are you crazy? <laughs> you live with John. <laughs> anyway, I don't know the answers, I wish I did, but um, you know, they have to have, a, a, they, have to, they need hope. You know, they need to feel that the world is gonna work for them. And I don't think they feel that. Kathleen, thank you very much. So, I really appreciate, in a minute, yeah. We appreciate your being here. Nick, thank you very much for your help. Uh, over the last two seasons, we have presented civility bells, which we give out, which some of you know. Uh, primarily to our, our panels, the people who have underwritten our programs, and uh, special people that have made everything work so well. So if, if there's anyone here who has previously received a civility bell, raise your hand, will you please? Okay, thank you all very much. We appreciate what you've done. Uh, and tonight we're gonna cross that mark of 100 civility bells have been given out, the theory being that if you have it and keep it in your office, if things get a little out of hand, you just ring the bell, and then basically hopefully things will work out. So tonight, you know, as always, we want to uh, like to present civility bells to our evening's guests and sponsors. So we have a bell for uh, Kathleen so coming. We have one for uh, Bob Rainier of uh, Bank of Blue Valley. Bob, raise your hand so that we can make sure you get your bell. Okay, that, thank you all very much. Now, we also have, we would have also given one to uh, Sue Nerman, but Sue already has received one, so we have something else for Sue, and we have something else for our chair, who's here, Mary Block. And so thank you all very much for everything you've done. I'm up here. Okay. Okay. okay, go ahead. No, I was just laughing because when I was with, um, with CNN and had that show, I had such a hard time getting an edge, an edge in word-wise. <laughs> that my assistant went and bought me one of these. And uh, when Elliot would get out of hand, I would hit that thing. So I'm happy to have another one in case I have that unfortunate situation again. That's very good. Okay, also, now I have a special, we have a couple special presentations tonight. Uh, one is for uh, Ellen Waters. Ellen, where are you? Ellen has worked, for, don't tell me she's gone. She's gotta be here somewhere. Ellen somewhere. has worked for us since we opened 
Uh, she will be leaving this week, and this is her last event. She's been one of the key people responsible for these events going forward. So Ellen, where are you? There she you are. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> right for all of your hard work over the last few years. And, and there are two other people that I want to uh, g give one to. First of all, we have uh, the person that uh, has worked very closely with me from the very beginning and uh, ha has really been a key part of all of this, and that is Scott Helm. Scott, you have your bell? Okay. Right. And, and there's another person here tonight who, uh, frankly, without him, I would not know most of you. And he was someone who, in the very, very beginning, he introduced me to Tom Block, who introduced me to Mary Block. He introduced me to Ward Katz. He introduced me to a whole bunch of people here, and that's Lou Berry. And Lou, thank you very much. Here we have a bell for Lou, I hope. Where's the, here we have a bell. Okay, we're going to take a brief break. Uh, you get time to refill your food. Kathleen gets to have some wine. Uh, those of you that want to play political trivia, we have it. It'll be set up here. You can sign up on a team. And on behalf of everyone at American Public Square, I want to thank you all very much for, for being here. The one person I haven't thanked publicly that I need to thank, of course, is Kim Jacobs, who's the one who runs everything. And, 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 Kim, and Kim is ably assisted by Jeff Fendorf and Sammy Dowd and Lindsey Harmon, okay? Uh, you know, I, I get to sit up here and talk with Kathleen, but they're the ones that do all the work, but I think some of you already knew that. Thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of the evening.